station to station, back to Abergavenny, I meet Mark Williams and Trevor Davis. <laughs> this is Newport Station which is a bit like where Chris Calvin gets off the, um, or gets out of the rocket in Solaris. Welcome to Outlaw Bookseller with me, Stephen Lee Andrews, and yes, I'm on holiday. Very smart to me, isn't it? I've got my own dressing room which I don't really need and it's the usual clothes there because of course travelled here by train and car and it's only a few days it's my trusty camera bag so I think we'll do a tour this is largely for the video editor but um where are we well we're in Hayon Way again like last year different place um, and this is my penthouse suite as you can see very charming got three nights here which is good with two of the chaps Mark and Trevor. The last time the three of us did this was 30 years ago. We did it two years running. Got the old super dry record bag there. And of course, we must have a look at the books. Oh gosh, we sell this in work. It's one of those things where inspirational quotes in the TFL underground duo. And it's annoying because I keep moving at the poetry and it keeps going back to transport, but it is what it is. And yeah, you know, it's the usual sort of B format nonsense here, but. Um, you know, that's, I guess, what the um, Hay Festival attracts. And the weather's mixed. The sun's going down soon. We've been to the co-op, got some provisions. And um, wonderful view of this um, yard here, I have to say. <laughs> so there are lots of wood. But yeah, the co-op is literally across there. You might be able to see it from here. You might not. Not that it's that interesting. Last time we stayed in here, I had issues with a headboard in the cottage. So I insisted to Mark, we must have decent headboards this time. So that was the um, that was the minimum standard. Got my own sweet chair. Let's have a look. Now, some of the lights tend to make this camera flicker, so I might have to reshoot this, or bits of it, with the um, old iPhone. But um, we'll see, really, how we do. Just head downstairs. So already we're on the first floor, and the guys have just left this stuff everywhere. It's shocking, it really is. So they've got the Christmas deckies up. Probably heard Miles Davis in the background, so I'll probably get sued by the estate of Columbia Records. This is the family bathroom. I always wonder what a family bathroom is. I've basically worked out that it's a bathroom in the shed, so that's a family bathroom. And one of the guys is going to be staying in here, so there's no ensuite here. This picture's a bit skewy. Look at that. Let's get that straight, that's better. So the chaps will be staying in here. And yeah, the weather's very changeable at the moment. There is some sunshine. I'm not going to fiddle too much with these. Oh God. And you can see why. <laughs> it's not working either way. Let me get, oh God, we'll get the blinds up and you might be able to see a bit of the weather. That's our back garden out there. Not that we're going to do Sunday then because it is, of course, January. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. Another room. Let's see what we got here in terms of books. 
again it's kind of the usual stuff really as you can see but very nice I think you'll agree really really nice lovely got your shower this is a bit like one of those property problems isn't it where the um, attractive young lady shows you around and tries to get you to spend your money and we've got a few more books there very good So yeah, it's Hay on Wire again, and it's not really a book buying trip this time. I thought, you know, I may buy some books, but I pretty much burned it down, as I've said before. And it's just really to relax a bit and to take some time out, because of course, because I work at Christmas time, I don't really get a holiday in the way that other people do. And so two weeks off at the end of January is a traditional sort of time for me. And I don't know how much of this will actually make it into a vlog whether I'll film very much. I'm not really going to film much around the town in the bookshops because you know I've done so much of that and you've seen it. If you haven't I'll put a playlist in at the end for you to have a look at and you'll see a lot more in my Hay videos which was about books and about SF particularly than you will pretty much in anybody else's. So, so we've been here now for let's see a few hours and we've sort of settled in. We've been to the supermarket which is across the road and as I said, with two of my friends, Mark and Trevor, and we did this holiday 30 years ago in 92 and 93. We went on holiday by mistake, as um, they say in With Nail and I, as Richard E. Grant said in With Nail and I. If you haven't seen With Nail and I, amazing film, you must check it out. Really brilliantly written, very funny and very elegiac and sound at the same time. So we've had a few hours to settle down. Um, we've had a couple of Tennessee Honey <laughs> Jack Daniels and Cokes, which um, which I contributed. And we're gonna go down to the pub and have something to eat, have a proper meal. And we've listened to some music. We listened to some Miles Davis, kind of blue. And we listened to some John Fox, Quiet Man. And we listened to JJ Burnell on Jour Parfait, A Perfect Day, which is, you know, favorite record of, of mine um, from the late eighties. And I wanted to say something really because this isn't something that occurred to me now, it occurred to me the other night, but I wanted to talk about it, which is about artists and death and what it must be like to be an artist and to know that death is coming. And on, on the way over on the train, Trev and I were talking about David Bowie, who of course passed on in 2016 and he released the album Black Star. And of course, a few days later he died and there's things on there about death, like I can't let everything go I think the track is called particularly I find moving even though people focus more on the title track and Lazarus I think I can't get let I can't let everything go is probably more direct and it's the one that I struggle to listen to but the thing is with being an artist is that you attain a kind of immortality by leaving your work behind whatever it is whether it's a book or a film or a piece of music or what have you so there's solace in that, I guess, that, you know, what you've left behind will live on. Even if it's not broadcast, it's there somewhere and it'll last, at, you know, a certain degree of time. Maybe it'll still be there once humanity's gone for some alien race to discover, you know, in a scrap heap. It'll still be there. But they, it must be hard because I guess the thing about being an artist is the joy of creating and of doing. And... As I say, we've listened to John Fox, who I know he has a house in Bath and is there sometimes and we bump into each other and I've been a big fan of his work for a very long time and we know each other a little. And 
it's one of those things where you know that the joy in doing, and I talk to him and I see him about what he's doing project-wise, and he always sort of gives me a few teasers about what he's doing. And the sheer sort of exaltation of, of the making of cultural production, you know, making of something fantastic, a work of art, you know, must be something hard to let go. The fact that you have, you know, you've left things behind, which gives you a kind of immortality must be great. But the whole thing of losing the thing of letting things go must be hard. So perhaps death for an artist is as hard as it is for all of us, maybe. Who can say? Very so exciting, sort of gloomy thoughts there. But it's just something I wanted to get across, really. Time to go to the pub now. Yeah. It's not all Italian, you know. So it's all right. Is this where you have your pizza? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty good. Can I try something different? Yeah, you had, you had pizza two nights running last time. That's not like you. I think when we came last year, I found in here as well. So, you know, this is the thing. So you want a pint of Betty Bach? Yes, please. And what do you have it? I'll have a half of Betty Bach. Half of Betty Bach. To start, yeah. Yeah. And I can have a pint of something. I've already really red cheeked because of that whiskey. Yes, I'm drinking lager and I don't care. A very small number of people have commented on the channel about me drinking sort of, you know, lager. This is Madri Spanish lager. And drinking like bad lager. Well, you know, I'll do what I like basically. But as I think I've said, given the choice, if I could get Draft Kirin, like Case Drinks and New Romancer, which I really like, you know, I would, but you can't, you can't find it anywhere. And if I could get Draft Lohenbrau, which I used to drink a lot in Italy, then, you know, I'd do that as well. But it is what it is. I'm not going to drink real ale just because you want me to, I'm afraid. That was the thing that Keith Roberts used to do. Apparently, when he went for a drink with Keith, if you didn't drink real ale, he would have a go at you all night and, you know, talk about you being like sort of a London sort of softy and stuff. But it's just probably a good thing I never got to go to the pub with Keith because I'd have probably been drinking cider then and, you know, and I just wouldn't have cared. But I think maybe he would have respected that. Perhaps he just wanted people to stand up to him, you know? Beer is this. Betty Bach. Now that's a Welsh name. It's a great pub, this. evening last night at the three tens drinks food and then we came back here and had some um, some sort of country rock and prog on YouTube to um, watch and listen to a few CDs it was good went to bed much later than I normally do and um, yeah but great, great times fantastic house absolutely fantastic coats are donned hats bags all the necessary impedimenta
Well, that was really quite sad. Uh, booths more and more going over to new books and the SF stock, well, it's just diminishing and diminishing. Nothing but third raters and broken spines. This is new, of course, Gayon Y, which I think is Wales's first alternative sexuality bookshop, I guess you could call it. Lights are out. It's early on a Tuesday morning, it's wet, so I can't blame them in a way. I think it's all new books, of course, and at some point when they deemed to be open, I could have gone and have a look. I really can't see how this will last. I mean, gay is the word in London is still going, but London and Hayon are two different animals. Of course, we're talking about the narrative here, of course, and, you know, nothing wrong with that. I, I love specialist bookshops. I want to see more of them, but, you know, you can't sustain a new bookshop on two festivals a year is my thinking. Adamant's my old mainstay where they have the best stuff usually. Admittedly the highest prices but you know he is a pro so it is what it is. And across the street Murder and Mayhem, the crime and horror bookshop that Derek Adamant runs which I might have a proper look in there today actually. I don't normally spend a lot of time in there but it is good. Okay, so I bought a few things at Adamant's had a chat with Derek, as I always do, he's a good lad. And I've got, let's see how much time, I've got about 40 minutes so I meet the guys for a coffee. So what do I do next? Do I do green ink? We'll have a look now. The thing is, as I've said a few times, is that I've really burned hay down now. I've a lot the last few years and obviously other people are buying stuff as well it's not just me but I have really pulled a lot out of it you know so I'm not expected to get anything spectacular and I haven't expected anything spectacular for a long time but I think even the days of the big book horse from two years ago are gone really
got a fantastic score there at the cinema bookshop a library of america slip case box set of two volumes of american crime novels which they let me have for it was 25 and they give me a trade discount because they know me there and um 20 quid and normally it's a lot more 40 to 60 and it's not available in the uk so i was really pleased with that i'll show you later on got talking in cinema to a lady um, who works in the sort of rare books department and she is mick heron fan and i got greg who works into mick heron and he got her into it and she, she was really nice to talk to her but she was like effusive thanking me which you know is it's just like nothing really it's one of those things where you know it's nice when people really appreciate you know that you've recommended something really good to them but you know for me it's like a daily thing really but yeah it's just really really good and like I said, I got a fantastic box set which I'll show you. So the book haul segment. Before I talk about the book haul, I wanted to sort of speak about something else really, which is about book reviews. And of course, that's a big thing on um, this channel and, you know, all sorts of book channels, booktube generally. It's about sort of, you know, people reviewing books. And I was thinking about this the other day, and I think really the best way to review a book for an audience which is receiving the data in an audio visual sense film or you know um, audio is really to read it aloud to the audience so you know that's the way you review it you read it aloud and people make their own mind up and this sort of leads me on to thinking about the question of whether listening to an audiobook is the same as actually reading and I've got nothing against audiobooks I've got friends who use them because they're time constrained and they can do it while they work and what have you. So I'm not against that, but I do think it's a different thing. I think you fire the arrow of attention and there's the physicality of holding the book, whatever format it is, there's the light, you know, the, the physical position you're in, the smell of the book, which is something I never notice people, other people do, because I'm always surrounded by books, so I don't notice it. Um, you know, the physicality of the format, and obviously it's less passive you know when you listen to something you're not making an effort to read you're just making enough effort to listen and not drift off so it is kind of a different thing so the culture of the book the physicality of the book the iconography of the book which i'm always banging on but i know is is missing the physical act is sort of going so really you know i think it's important particularly with reading asf you know you have to engage with the ideas and you have to concentrate on the ideas on the cognitive dissonance and really sort of pull it forward you know you have to sort of engage in a very full way so i'm not so certain that that's the best way really to to listen to things i don't think it's the same experience at all and i can see why people do it but um i'll probably do it in my eyes fell but it's generally not for me i've got some audiobooks of course but you know it's not quite the same thing so we look at the physicality of books and we look at the culture and the iconography of the book in this book hall and of course, with reading SF, you're reading the novel of ideas. And the novel of ideas is something I want to talk more about on the channel, because I think there are things which are similar to SF thematically, or that they occupy a similar space in literature and art, which is about ideas. And I think it's possible to have the novel of ideas, which isn't science fiction, even though it'd be on the edge of that. And a lot of the novels I like, which aren't SF, I would characterise as novels of ideas, and that tends to be what I look for. I tend not to look for social novels, novels of character and family and class and that sort of thing, because to me that's a really 19th century thing. And I think once you get to modernity, you need to focus on more ideas. So let's have a look on the book hall and see if we have any novels of ideas. And we'll probably come up with some really poppy stuff now, which will make you real with the pretentiousness of it all. This is The Bull and the Spear by Michael Moorcock, which is one of the Quorum books, and I've read this many times, and this is a quartet 
edition from the mid 70s and um, Patrick Woodruff cover and Patrick Woodruff did a lot of sort of album covers for prog rock bands that sort of thing really good artist did a lot of cover work for a quartet interesting little company quartet and um, the Corum books they initially they're like all from different publishers and finally um, Harper Collins got the right name in Granada and what have you so but I had visions of coming here to Hay and picking up you know three or four of the um, quartet Moorcox they did some of the Jerry Cornelius ones they didn't all the Corum ones but I do love his cover art and I just decided it was time to pick these things up when I see them in good neck got that from our demands and also something else I got from um, Adamans, which I, I, I don't have a copy at the moment and it's somebody I'm not that fond of but I feel I should have a copy of it for the library for the final library and I've read it for a long time and the edition I had was an old second-hand one um, this is Olaf Stapleton's Last and First Men which is in print as a Gollant's masterwork but this is a Penguin B format classic science fiction edition from the late 80s very handsome as you see and it's got the atomic sort of symbol there which is like um the thing in this island earth isn't it you know, on the um on the bridge of the spaceship from metaluna and you know this is about the future of mankind and stable and of course wasn't a genre writer in terms of he wasn't published in the magazines he was a british writer he had books published so he's more in the sort of wells em forster thing you know cosmic visions and not somebody i'm massively fond of but i remember this series well they're only ever about eight or ten books in this series and my mate graham's got them all you know and um i don't think i bought many of them at the time because they were books i already had and had read and i wasn't that keen on them but now they've acquired a patina of their own in time nice 80s thing there um across the road from adi man he has this shop uh, murder and mayhem which you will have seen and you'll see me in there on the video and i got this karnaki the ghost finder um, sometimes called Karnaki the Ghost Hunter, I seem to remember. And this is a Grafton one from 1991, A format, beautiful condition. So that was seven pounds. I actually I got discounts on this stuff from Adam because Derek was giving me a discount. So really, really nice. You don't often see these things in that condition. And um, I have read some of these, but I've never had a collection of them. So that's kind of interesting. The Occult Detective, and of course, the House on the Borderland is is the one really. Then a book which. I've tried and tried and tried to find a really good copy of this and I can never find one and this is about the best one I've seen and it's really been annoying me for decades because you just can't find a nice copy anywhere and this is Norman Spinrad's The Star Spangled Future and it's got a remainder cut on the bottom there and it's a bit dirty. The spine is unbroken, it's a bit faded, the text block um, requires some action. But this is far better than any copy I've ever seen, even back in the day. So it has been really bugging me. And as a Norman Spinner, a completist, I thought, I'm going to get that and forget it until I read it. Because I've never read this one, so I'm pleased to get on that. Something I got from Green Ink Books, which is a really good shop. It's one of the newer shops in Hay. And it's the only one that's opened up in the last 10 years that has the true Hay on Y bibliophile bibliomaniac feel the old school second-hand bookshop this deep range and what have you and that's um science fiction history science and vision by skulls and rapkin i used to have this i bought this back in the 80s and i got rid of it in a in a sort of cull and i wish i kept it because it's really good robert skulls really good critic and this is like sort of potted history of sf and a critical approach to it which takes in history into account which i'm really big on as you know and my theories are about how fiction evolved through history and tie in with history and he's big on that as well and i've just been looking through it and i think a lot of those ideas filtered through from him like they did with the norman spinrad book uh, which i mentioned a while ago science fiction in the real world i think they had more impact on me than i initially recognized and that was four pounds you can't really go wrong really so i thought then i was done because i have kind of burned hay down and because this time i've traveled over by train to Abergavenny and then my friend Mark has picked me and Trevor up and driven us here to Hay. He lives in Swansea so he goes the other way, he'll drop us back at the station but it's quite a long distance and normally the video winner brings me over so I can't carry too much as I've got bags of clothes and accoutrements and I'll just go my little Capri bag here which you'll have seen in my um, Capri videos which I got at um, Conchilia, the um, bookshop and press 
happy. I got a couple of amazing scores really, which I was really pleased with, but I spent more money than I intended to, but that's often the way. But when you see things of this quality, you've just got to take it on. So what did I get? Well, something that I keep looking at online um, and I keep thinking I want to buy it, and it's not distributed in the UK, so I can't get a staff discount for my job, is American Noir of the 30s, 40s and 50s slipcase set from Library of America. And this is normally 40 to 60 quid new. And this was 25. And the lady at Francis Edwards Books in Cinema Bookshop, which is their collectible bit, she said, oh, you're the guy who put Greg, my boss, onto Mick Heron. And he put me onto Mick Heron and whatever. And she said, I'm going to knock another five pounds off you. And you weren't going to trade anyway. So it's a trade discount. So that was really nice. So I'll just pull these out the slipcase. So two volumes and I've read a lot of these books this is crime novels American noir of the 1930s and 40s very beautiful and it's got six books in there um, James M Kane the postman always rings twice which is the cornerstone of noir it is really the thing of it it's very very much the book as far as I'm concerned because noir really is hard-boiled is the detective stuff the Sam Spade stuff from Dashiell Hammett and Chandler. Kane is different. Kane is about ordinary people. It's not about the chivalric or tough gumshoe. It's about the criminal element in ordinary people and the maliciousness and the malevolence that comes out in ordinary people. And there's lots of lust and greed and what have you. So that's an important book. And, you know, the as an existentialist crime novel, it's, it's unsurpassed. And Double Indemnity is the other really great one as well. So, and Post Noir Rings twice. Horace McCoy, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Which um, was also filmed. Um, and it's a novel about, they used to have these dance contests in America in the 30s, where, you know, if you could keep dancing for days and days and days, you'd give like a big prize money, you'd pay a bit to enter. And then if you were still alive at the end of it, then people could have little breaks, but you had to stay awake. And that was the thing. And I've never read it. Um, the film's really good. They shoot horses, don't they? Also, Edward Anderson, Thieves Like Us, which I know less of. That's the one I haven't read in here. Kenneth Fearing's The Big Clock. And The Big Clock is a book I read a few years ago. I think it's in NYRB Classics, which was also filmed. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen the film. I'm not massive on film noir. That's the thing. I'm not a huge fan of film noir. I like the sort of novels. And they're quite different. And... I had this strange experience with noir a few years ago in work. It must have been five, six years ago, maybe a bit longer. And this lady came in the shop and she had a little dog with her. And she said, oh, you know, I want to read some, some noir fiction, you know, and I'm really interested in it. And I had a chat with her and talked to her about it. And I sold her a load of books. And she came back and apparently she came back the following week or a week later. And it was my day off and she wanted to speak to me again. And my friend who I work with said to me, oh, Alison, not Alison, um, yeah, he said, it's Alison Goldfrapp um, came in and asked for you. And it's really weird because at that point I had all the Goldfrapp records up to that point. I've seen them in concert and um, Will Gregory, who does the music in Goldfrapp, I'd see him in the shop and talk to him. And um, I didn't recognise her. You know, she was dressed down. She didn't have all the glitzy glam rock, electronic clothing on. And I didn't realise it was her, which was really funny. But my friend said, oh, she absolutely loved the book she recommended. And he's no slouch. She knows his stuff as well. So he was able to recommend her more. And then a while later, they made an album. And she said, oh, this is very influenced by um, by noir fiction. And um, But I like the fiction. I don't like, you know, film noir. Same as me. So so there you go. So I played a little part in a gold wrapper, which is amazing. But there you go. Anyway, back to the book. Um William Lindsay Gresham, Nightmare Alley, which has been filmed twice recently by Del Toro. I'm not that fussed on. Great novel. I read it about 10, 12 years ago in NYRB Classics. And it's about a geek. And of course, what a geek is really is somebody who bites the head off a chicken in a sideshow, in a carnival. That's what a geek is. You know, it's, it's somebody, somebody who's alcoholic and, you know, and to get their booze money, they would have to bite the head off a live animal, you know. So it's a great book, actually. Um, so you see noir is different to just crime. It's a different thing. And then Cornell Woolrich's I Married a Dead Man, which sounds great. And Cornell Woolrich, really interesting figure. I've read books by him, but not that one. Um, 
the word black comes up in the title of almost every book Woolrich ever wrote. And um, quite funny, really, he had a terrible life and he ended up living in a flop house hotel and had his leg amputated. And I don't think he ever married. Interesting figure. Um, the bride wore black, things like that. One thing about these, um, about these, um, these editions is they have um, the list of books underneath the jacket which is really nice and they've done some great science fiction an anthologies as well which um omnibuses i should say because these are omnibuses because they're complete novels and i, I think i think might show them on his channel i've got them as well they're really nice so this is american noir of the 1950s and jim thompson the killer inside me jim thompson's like the philip k dick of crime fiction he wrote a lot of books he drank a lot not the dick did dick was you know drugs instead um, and there are about four or five which are amazing and I've read I think 12 or 15 of his books. Killer Inside Me has been filmed twice, um, really great book about a cop, first person narrative of a cop in a small town, he's at the sheriff and he's actually a killer, he's a serial killer, it's fantastic. Patricia Highsmith's The Talent of Mr Ripley, forget the film, the film is good but there's an earlier film called Plain Soleil and um, Purple Noon with Alain Delon, which is much more faithful, except in the very final scene. Amazing book, one of the great novels of the 20th century. And then it's sequels, four sequels. The second and third ones are even better. Most people read The Talent of Mr. Ripley and they don't read the sequels, so they think they've done it. But the first one, as good as it is, only set you up for what is to come. Amazing. Um, Charles Williford, pick up Charles Williford is for my money the finest pro stylist who ever graced crime fiction. Brilliant. Pickup's an early book. Really, really good. David Goodis down there. Um, David Goodis is most sort of well known for the Truffaut film, Shoot the Piano Player, which, what's the original title of the book? I think the book had a different title initially, but I've read it as Shoot the Piano Player. And I was talking with somebody on the channel the other day in the comments, and um, I've read about... I think I've read five Goodest books. This is Down There, um, which I haven't read. And Down There, of course, that's the same title as Le Bar, Down There by J.K. Heismans, which is a sort of late 19th century French symbolist novel about Satanism. It's often translated with different different titles, but Down There, in which you think of hell, is great stuff. And Goodest is very romantic. He is like... He's got that sort of sentimental streak that Jack Kerouac had, and I have to be in the mood for his stuff. He did a book called The Moon in the Gutter, which was filmed by Jean-Jacques Beignot, who filmed Diva, which is one of the great 80s movies. Diva is based on the novels by Della Corta, Daniel Odier, who did a book-length interview with William Burroughs called The Job. I know there's a lot of information coming up, but this is the way things are. Um, so I've not read anything about it for ages, and I'm looking forward to that. And finally, Chester Hines' The Real Cool Killers, which I've not read. God, I must have read that way back in the 80s. And Chester Hines is black. He lived in Paris, I think, a lot. He, he sort of went to Paris like lots of the jazz musicians did in the 50s and 60s to escape the racism in America. And um, he wrote about these two Harlem-based detectives who were black. Coffin Ed is one of them. I can't think what the other one's called. Let's have a look. Um, let's see. Coffin Ed and Gravedigger Jones. And they're quite cartoony. I, I'd like to reread it because I'm a long time. Very hard to take seriously. But, you know, good sort of Harlem post Harlem Renaissance stuff. So I was really, really pleased with that because I kept looking at it. And as I've said before, what I don't like about Library of America, even though it's nice cloth binding, the paper's very thin, you know, the paper's very thin, but it's great to have these books in, in hardcover editions and I can read the ones I haven't read. So I was really, really pleased with that. Fantastic stuff, American noir. I do love American crime fiction. Then a book which I already have, which I saw in... Hay on White Books, and it was just there amongst the general fiction. As you see, this is um, Katie and Company by Keith Roberts. And, you know, I talked about Keith an enormous amount on the channel. And I thought, oh, there it is. And I've got a copy of this. This is the first Kerasina book. I have a complete collection of Kerasina in the signed limited state editions, except for the Jaguar Hunter by Lucia Shepard. I've got a trade edition of that. I need to get a signed one, which I think I can I can manage to a friend of mine. Um, and I got this one, but I haven't got it signed. So interestingly enough, I opened this up and there is some way on the jacket and there you go. 
this is the limited edition and it says on it this booklet means you've got the special edition you can see it is keith's signature the numbering and um it's just really really lovely and that was 30 pounds but what i'm going to do i'm going to take the jacket from my own edition which i've had for years which is a much better neck and swap it onto this and then so i'll customize it and i'll create a new copy as it were which i'll sell on so if anybody's interested and i'll sell that at a reasonable price and also inside it was the chat book which came with the limited edition katie's apocalypse and i've got a copy of this as well anyway this is hand numbered really really nice so if anybody's interested in buying a decent copy um of katie and company at a reasonable price um go to about on the channel and email me and we'll see if we can sort something out uk only though please I don't really have time to sort of send things to America. I'm sorry, but I just I just don't have the time these days. But, you know, try me. You never, never know. You never know. So I've got that. So that's the book already, quite small. Um, I've got tomorrow to go. I'm not sure what we're going to do tomorrow. We're going to go back to the pub in, in about an hour and have a meal and stuff. It's just great to get away. And um, it's just been such a tough time the last year. I've had polymyalgia for nearly... A year now and it's just been really, really tough sort of come here and have this really lovely house to sort of stay in and just uh relax with old friends it's great really so that's that for now so what else are we going to do i guess you'll see tomorrow's shoot later in this video or maybe in the next one <music>